Christ today, that, that we will see ourselves, see you, that we will, will respond to what you show us, and that you will be glorified in what is um, said, and, and that you will be the one that our eyes are fixed on, that our hearts are fixed on, and that we truly would have a greater sense of gratitude, of thanksgiving for who you are just in yourself and for what you have done on behalf of, of mankind. Um, Lord, help us not to live in indifference before you, in complacency before you, that would stir up our hearts, our affections, that we will see more clearly all that you are and that you have done and your goodness to call us to yourself. Lord, give us the grace to respond to what you show us today. For Jesus' sake, I ask it. Amen. So we're going back to Galatians. We're going to finish chapter 4. And this is uh, more uh, the, the conclusion of, of the doctrinal uh, aspect of Galatians, the teaching of what the truth is in regard to salvation, regard to Christ, in regard to the law, and where the Galatians, um, where Paul found them at this point, having begun in Christ alone, through faith alone, by the power of the Spirit alone, just believing to then wanting to return to those weak and worthless elemental things of the world, as he said, and, and apply a tradition and Jewish customs such as circumcision and observing certain festivals and making that then in some way additional to Christ for salvation. So this is the, the conclusion of, of the doctrinal aspect, the truths that are being taught. And then as we go into chapters 5 and 6, will be more the application of those truths and, and how you live out the Christian life by the power of the Spirit. So today we want to look at verses 21 through 31 and see his, his final um, illustrations given to the Galatians in regard to salvation and how it is received, not earned, but received. So let's read 21 through 31, then we'll come back and take a look at these verses. So Galatians 4, 21. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise this is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. And now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she, speaking of Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children, speaking of the Jews. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who is born according to the spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. So the question would be for each person, are you slave or are you free? In which category? Uh, all people in the world fall into one of those two categories. We're either a slave, a slave to our flesh, a slave to sin, a slave to some uh, perception of salvation that's apart from Christ, 
seeking to earn, to win it, to, to do what is sufficient, or we are free from that burden, free from sin, free from the penalty of it, and free from the burden of a law that we cannot keep, and we have been freed. We've been uh, proclaimed not guilty before the law. Therefore, we are free from it. So are we slave or free? And that's what he's putting to the people here. Are the, the, the slavery and the comparison of that, uh, looking back into the Old Testament, to then the freedom that is found solely in Christ. So this is a probing question. He's wanting them to think about it. And he's wanting them, really, you ask the question to get them to be able to articulate to you an answer. Can you put into words what you believe? what you think, what, what you perceive to be truth. Can you articulate it? So he's wanting them, he's asking them, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Do you not recognize? Can you explain to me how the law fits into salvation for you? How did you come to salvation? And what then, uh, how can you explain it? So he wants them to examine themselves to look at their own lives, to look at what they've experienced, to look at the truth of history, to look at the truth of what he's proclaimed to them, to look at all of it, evaluate it, and, and really see what the, what the truth is. I think he's also saying to them, you know, have you looked down the road under the law to see what life would be like for you if you continue to have to live under the law? Have you considered the, the ultimate you know, repercussions of this? Like, it's not just going to be for this moment that you're going to, like, get yourself circumcised and everything's okay, but you are wanting to put yourself under restrictions that will have to guide you the remainder of your lifetime, and you'll have to keep the law. Are you not recognizing what you are putting yourself into? So, as we're saying, there's either, you know, a slave or you're free. The two sons, the two women that were of Abraham represent both of those categories. One is of the flesh and one is of the promise. So looking back at the story, we need to know what took place, generally speaking, a summary of what happened in the Old Testament, who Hagar and, and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac were. So we know that, that God had come to Abraham back in Genesis told him that you're going to have a son, and he was only like 75 years old. Well, he gets to be, you know, 85 years old, 90 years old, 95 years old, still had this, had this son actually earlier than that. Um, but from 75 um, up until he's 85 or so, no child. So Sarah, or Sarai, as she was at the time as his wife, and Sarai owned a slave woman named Hagar who was an Egyptian. So... Sarai says, you know, I guess it's just not going to happen. I mean, not with us. I mean, she was about 10 years younger, so she's 75 or so. He's 85-ish, 86, whatever. And so she recommends <clears throat> to Abraham that he take Hagar, make her his wife, have a child by Hagar, and then by adoption she will take that child, and that must be the way that God's going to work this out. So <clears throat> Abraham does what Sarah recommends. He takes Hagar, and sure enough, Hagar gets pregnant, and she has Ishmael. So um, things did not go well with that relationship. Uh, actually, at the beginning, when Hagar realized she was pregnant, then she began to look down on Sarah, kind of taunt her, make fun of her. You know, I'm going to have a child, you're not, uh, whatever went on, because... I know it still matters today, but in that culture, really, I think womanhood was not full if you did not have a child. And, of course, for, um, you know, for the man, he had nothing to pass anything on to. And, and so, so children were, um, you know, the, the most precious thing that you could have in life. And so here's Hagar taunting Sarah because now I'm pregnant, you're not, I'm going to have the child, I'm going to have Abraham's child, he's going to be the heir of everything. And so Sarah was not um, too excited about the situation, even though technically this was going to be her child that she was going to get to raise. Well, um, about 14 years later, whenever Abraham is 99, 
Actually, the child will be born when he's 100, but when he's 99 and Sarah's around 90, um, God comes to him and says, no, you are going to have a child. And in Isaac is where the, the heirship, uh, the, the descendants will be named through Isaac, uh, through the child that you and Sarah will have. So this is based not on human capability. It's done through the normal means of procreation, but this is something that came only of the promise that on their own, they would not have had the capability to produce a child. So this child is the one of promise. It's what God said would happen because he ordained it to happen, and only by his power could it occur because she was well past the age to be able to be bearing children. And so one is the natural child, Ishmael, born of the flesh, born of the will of man, not of the will of God, but born of the will of man. Then you have Isaac, which is born of the promise of the will of God, the power of God, and it's the, what is ordained by God to carry out the plan that he has determined. So this was from a promise, and it was fulfilled solely by the power of God, not by the will of man. John 1 states it this way when he said, But as many as received him, speaking of Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And that's the way Isaac came into being, was by the will of God, although through the natural means, but only by the power of God. <clears throat> so Jews in the flesh are children of Abraham. They're descendants of Abraham. And um, they, uh, they are you know, recognizing that they are to abide by the covenant of circumcision, that they're to abide by the law that was given. And in their minds, that is what is, is necessary for salvation. But what Paul is saying is so there is no distinction for Jew or for Gentile as how you come to God because it's based on promise. It's based on the power of God to give life, not on what man can do. Whether we're talking about the creation of a child or the creation of spirit life. Man does not have that capability. It's by the promise and it's only by the power of God. So the Jews are limiting themselves to obedience of the law, to maintaining that and finding their salvation in their Jewishness, their descendancy from Abraham, and in their ability to keep the law. And yet what is the law? In 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. The law, all it can do is condemn. It can only show you where you fail and under the law, you must die. And he's gone through that previously here in chapter 3, that sin is because of the law, and that is, then the result is death. So that's what you want to return to. You want to return to living under the law, which ultimately results in death. There's no hope of liberation under the law. It keeps you in chains. It keeps you captive. So he asked them again in verse 21, do you not listen to the law? Do you not know what it is or what the law requires and what the result is for those who do not keep the law completely? Do you not recognize your condition if you remain under the law? Because that which is born of the flesh is flesh and subject to the flesh in all ways. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So both realms, physical and spiritual, are brought about by means of a birth. There is a birth. And the birth is a very real, very objective, very personal event. It has to happen to you, physically and spiritually. It's brought about by an agent outside of yourself. The human standpoint, a mother and a father produce a child. You have to be created by someone else. You don't just appear on your own. Someone possessing that type of life can only be the, be the only one who can give you life. So born physically, in the physical way, as Ishmael was, or born spiritually, 
which Isaac represented, that can only come from the life that God gives and that God has. It's the spirit, Jesus says in John. It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. In other words, it contributes nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. And it's only through the life-giving power of the spirit that you can be born again. So Paul uses this allegory to explain the two covenants. Hagar <clears throat> in the flesh and represents the flesh. She represents sin. She represents the law and the bondage to all of those things. She represents the Jewish nation of that day who was still living according to Jewish custom, tradition, law, and belief that that is their means of salvation. She represents really everyone that is outside of Christ. Everyone that is living according to the flesh and whatever they're putting their hope and their trust in, whether they have no belief in God at all or whether they're the most religious person in the world, but trusting in that, whomever it is, if you're outside of Christ, you're in the flesh, subject to sin, subject to the law, subject to condemnation, and subject to death, and the result after that is hell. That's what Hagar represents. Sarah, on the other hand, <clears throat> represents the spiritual life that's granted under the covenant of grace through Jesus alone. And this came about from the promise of God, not of man's doing. Again, Isaac could not have been created simply by Abraham and Sarah. I mean, they've been trying to have children for decades and hadn't. It wasn't until the promise that came through the power of of God. So Hagar was the physical Jerusalem of that day and the Jewish people who were under the law. Sarah is the Jerusalem that is from above, the heavenly kingdom, the spiritual world, which is only of the spirit and it cannot be corrupted, it cannot be destroyed, it cannot be altered. We cannot be brought into subjugation to the law again. We are free in Christ and in the spirit and no longer subject to sin the penalty of it, which is death. We're liberated. We're free. Therefore, in verse 27, <clears throat> Paul goes back to Isaiah and quotes this from Isaiah 54, which says, Shout for joy, O barren one, you who have borne no children. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. In other words, gone through childbirth and the labor. For the sons of the desolate one, the one who is barren, will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. So he's taking them back to a time when it was prophesied that Jerusalem would be, that, um, that there would be a, a newness and, and that, that they would be returned from captivity and that it's not what you can do. It's not based upon your capabilities. It's based upon what the Lord will do and he will bring about many children by means that can only come through the spirit and not through what the flesh can do. So these Gentiles that he's speaking to in Galatia are not of the race of Abraham, so they can't claim that. And they have nothing to base anything on um, except by means of adoption. That God has chosen to bring them into his family because of what he alone can do, not because they can claim anything as a descendant of Abraham. So it's solely by the promise of God. So he's saying, rejoice, shout for joy. And that's why he goes back to the scripture from, from Isaiah saying, do you realize, people, you were not in the covenant family of God in the beginning. You were not under the Abrahamic covenant. You had no reason. You were without God and without hope in the world, as he told the Ephesians. He said, but God, in his mercy, has come to you to give you new birth, not because of anything you have done, not because of anything you have earned. How do you think you're going to start by the Spirit and then perfect yourselves somehow in the flesh? Going to back, back to what he told them earlier in the book. The beauty of that, he says in Ephesians 2, he expresses it in this way. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, and solely in Christ Jesus, he said, you who formerly were far off, meaning the pagans of Ephesus, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, Jew and Gentile, 
into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall between them by abolishing in his flesh the enmity or being at odds with God, which is what? Which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that in himself, in Christ himself, he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. So they are one, Jew, Gentile, only through the cross of Christ. By it, speaking of the cross, having put to death the enmity, that um, being at, at odds with God, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, both Jew and Gentile. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father, So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. You are part of the family. In Christ alone, he's broken down the dividing wall. There is no Jew-Gentile any longer. There is no need to fulfill Jewish custom and tradition and, and, and law because it's only in Christ. So that's why they should rejoice and break forth and shout. They should they should stand in awe of their position in Christ because they've been born of the spirit, not of the flesh. They didn't have anything to hold on to. They could not claim anything in the flesh. They are God's children because he chose them, not due to their biology. Back in 4, 9, chapter 4, verse 9, he had said, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it? that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. So they need to realize that what they have now is much more precious than what the Jews are relying on. The Jews are, that has no value in relation to Christ. What you have is much more precious the precious blood of Christ, as Peter says in in his epistle. So according to God's grace that called them out of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son is the means by the grace of God. Luther said this. Luther said, Isaiah calls the church barren because her children are born without effort by the word of faith through the spirit of God. It's A matter of birth, not of exertion, he says. The believer, too, works, but not in an effort to become a son and an heir of God. He he is that before he goes to work. He is born a son and an heir. He works, then, for the glory of God and the welfare of his fellow men. You're born into relationship, not work your way there. So in verse 28... When he says, and you, brethren, then, like Isaac, are children of promise. God did this just as he did with Isaac. Sarah and Abraham obeyed God, but they were not capable apart from the working of God. And you, too, are children of promise. So then the question for us is, well, what is my standing with God based on? What am I relying on in relation to him? Am I relying on anything that I have done? Has there been a change in me that can only be attributed attributed to the work of God? Do I see the transformation? Do I see new life? Do I see something that represents a new birth that is different than the person that I have been before? Is there evidence that the Spirit of God lives in me. What is it that I'm hoping in? Am I resting in religion? Am I resting in good works? Or is it Christ alone? Has it been something that has happened to me or something that I have sought to make happen by means of of some kind of action on my part? Well, in verse 29, Paul speaks of the division between the flesh and those who were born of the promise. I already mentioned Hagar taunted Sarah, Genesis 16, 
says that Abraham went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said to Abraham, may the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms. But when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. So there's this antagonism between the flesh and between the spirit, whether it be in the individual or whether it be between those who live according to the world and those who live according to the spirit, there is an enmity and it can never be resolved. There will always be antagonism between the spirit and the flesh. Isaac, I mean, uh, Ishmael also persecuted Isaac. In Genesis 21, it says, Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking Ishmael. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. Interestingly, God told Abraham to listen to what Sarah said and send her out. And so he did. For through Isaac, God told Abraham this. He said, for through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. The flesh has no part in the spirit world. The flesh has no part. It can't involve itself. It can't engage it. It can't understand. The flesh has no understanding of the things of the spirit. And so they had to be cast out. And so that's what he had told them here. He said, cast out the bondwoman and her son. And so he is quoting this. Paul is quoting this in verse 30. Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So this is true for the Galatians. He's wanting them to see this, that they are being persecuted by the Jews. The Jews are trying to, to bring them back into captivity, to unite fleshly means for salvation with spiritual means of salvation and the Jews are relying on what they are as the sins of Abraham what they can do following the law but it was by the promise that the inheritance was to be received and that was by believing and it was administered only through the spirit of God not according to the works of the flesh so if they want to receive the inheritance it has to be in the same way both Jew and Gentile they were seeking to come in to the kingdom in some other way than through the narrow gate, through Christ alone. So cast out the bondwoman. The flesh, they are holding to the flesh, the Jews are, not to the promise. And they are putting commands, responsibilities upon these Galatians. And yet there's only one command given in the New Testament as to receive Christ and that is to believe, actually to repent and to believe. That's what's required. Uh, the day of Pentecost, Peter said, repent. When they said, what do we do? Repent. The Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing you can do. It is by placing faith in him. So everyone is born in bondage. All of us are born in bondage. We're born according to the flesh. And you're still in bondage if you've not put your faith in Christ for salvation. You're in bondage if you're trusting in anything other than Christ. Sadly, one of the most common and one of the most powerful um, means of enslavement is religion. Religion often is the thing that, that keeps the truth from being heard because the trust is in what we do in religion not in what Christ has done and resting upon that. It offers false assurance and it has no power to save because only Christ has the power. There are many people who are practicing dead religion. They're trusting in what they can do or what they don't do. They're trusting in what they're affiliated with, etc. Whether that be Buddhism, Hinduism, whether it be Islam, whether it be Mormonism, or whether it even be people who are in a Baptist church. Trusting in religion, trusting in my affiliation, and my belonging to something, trusting in something I did in 1964, trusting in something that is, is a part of a system or, or a, a, an, an act 
that, that represents something, but is it truly Christ? Religion is a very dangerous thing if we let it usurp Christ and become our objective or what we're trusting in. Philip Reichen, a, a current theologian, says this. He says, from the very beginning, there was a fundamental spiritual difference between the two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. One son was born by proxy, the other by promise. One by works, the other came by faith. One was a slave, the other was free. Thus, Ishmael and Isaac represent two entirely different approaches to religion. Law against grace, flesh against spirit, self-reliance against divine dependence. Because there's no answer in religion. Religion does not offer us anything other than a code of conduct and how we can conduct our lives. And there may be benefits to it in my life, benefits for the world, but it is not an avenue to Christ. The narrow door, the narrow way is Christ alone. And if we're trusting in anything, even though it be a good thing, if it's outside of Christ, it offers no hope and will perish with um, believing in that. Unless you repent, Jesus said, you will all likewise perish. Christianity cannot save. Only Christ can save. So for any type of trust in a religion or a philosophy that is not Christ, it will not provide salvation. Spurgeon said it like this. He said, not all the works Ishmael ever rendered to his father could make him a freeborn son because he was born a slave. Doing doesn't save. We cannot earn it. You have to be born to be brought into relationship with God. The old covenant, interestingly, said, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. In the new covenant, God says, I will. I will be your God. I will redeem you from your sins. I will give you the free gift of eternal life. God says, I will in the new covenant, the old covenant, thou shalt and thou shalt not. The onus on us in the new covenant, Christ alone was sufficient, and we receive what Christ has done. And what does he bring? Really, the beauty of the Christian life is life. Really, what the Christian life is, is life. And look at how Jesus termed, you know, spoke of himself that he said, I'm the living water. I am the living bread that comes down out of heaven. It's the spirit that gives life. He says in John, I looked up the word life and I think it was in the New Testament it was like 265 times or so. And of course there are other types of life it's referencing, but the majority of those had to do with spirit life. Look at just a few of the, and, and thinking about what Christianity really boils down to. In Matthew, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter into life, crippled or lame. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. And you are unwilling to come to me, he told the Pharisees, so that you may have life. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. I am the way, the truth and the life, and on and on and on. It's life. It's life. It's one of the things I love most about Pilgrim's Progress is at the beginning he's reading in a book, which is the Bible, about the city of destruction, that he's doomed for destruction. Fire is going to fall and destroy the city, and he's trying to get others to go with him. They will not, so he leaves everyone behind, including wife and children, and he puts his fingers in his ears because they're all calling after him. Come back, come back. You're a fanatic. You're, you're insane. You're a lunatic. He puts his fingers in his ears where he can't hear, hear them. And as he runs toward the gate, he is crying, life, life, eternal life. It's life that Christ brings. These people are wanting to return to death. They're wanting to return to 
obligation that they cannot fulfill. They're, they're giving up life for the sake of, of doing something in the flesh that has no power to do anything for them. So, in verse 31, after putting all this before them, he says, So then, brethren, we're not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. You're not slaves, not if you're in Christ. If you're wanting to go back to slavery, you're wanting to go back to Egypt, you don't trust God that he alone can save. You're putting your hope in something that you can do and it is Christ alone. In Christ, we have life. We have freedom from our sinful nature that can be overcome. We have freedom from sin and its consequences, the destructive effects. We have the freedom from the requirements that the law puts on us. And now the law is something like one of the verses in one of the songs we sang said talked about writing the law of God on our heart. Now it is in me, and God has given us a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone, that we might love those things. And as we've talked about in Psalm 119, delighting in the things of God. So now the law is something that I, I enjoy. I want to know God. I want to follow that because I want, I'm his child. I have his, his nature, his DNA in me that then causes me to long for and love the things of God. So my obedience is out of desire to honor him, not out of a compulsion because of some obligation that somehow earns me a right standing with him. So Christ now becomes the objective. He becomes the desire of my heart. It's not just religious duty. And if I find religion is something that is the only aspect really of my life, that thing that, that is God to me, then I'm living way below what God has desired for us to have and made available to us through Christ. It's Christ alone. It's God himself that should be our portion and our delight. And all of this can only come through the promise by God, not of our doing. And so that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, literally made new. All the old things are passed away and new things have come. That is what God offers, is this life, this freedom. And he's telling them, Galatians, you're not of the bondwoman. Don't go back to that. Don't let religion, don't let personal pursuit and, and, and personal effort be what determines the life that you are going to live. You're of the free woman. It's of the spirit. And there's power found only in Christ and the spirit of God, not in religion. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin <clears throat> is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Only the son can set us free, the son of promise. Only those who are born of the promise, who are born of the spirit of God, only there is their true freedom. And that is forever because it said the son remains forever. So freedom and life, they're in Christ and only in Christ. What are you trusting in? What's your experience with God? Not with religion, but your experience with God. Not church, not morality, not the will of the flesh, I've overcome this. What's our experience with God? That's the only thing that will be examined on the day that we stand before God. Is it Christ? Am I trusting in Christ alone, by his grace alone, that he chose to do this, that he has called me to himself, and through faith I said, yes, Lord, and received the salvation that only he can provide. Well, let's pray. Lord God, <clears throat> I, I thank you that, that you have made it clear. But Lord, unless you open our eyes, we don't see because that which is born of the flesh is flesh and understands the things of the flesh and that which is of the spirit, then the spirit. And so we ask, I'm asking you to 
to make us aware, to, to give us understanding, to give us ears to hear, and Lord, to, to respond in faith to you. And that to recognize if I'm trusting in anything, if I'm looking at myself and anything I either belong to or am doing, anything that, that I think constitutes somehow merit in your eyes, that God, I would turn from that and repent of that and turn by faith to Christ alone and to place my whole hope and my faith in him. And Lord, that you would grant life life to us, that we will know life. And, if, and if, if there are believers here who are not living in the hope of life, they're not, they're not finding the reality of, of the life of the Spirit of God, then, then, Lord, bring us to a place of repentance or to recognition of, of why that is true. And that, Lord, we would come to you and, and eat this bread of life and drink this living water that that we might have life in us as as you jesus told the the woman at the well that that there would be springs of living water that will continually come up in our lives and and will never be thirsty again for those things that don't satisfy so lord give us <clears throat> life and show us where it is that we may feast at that table and lord that we may just experience what it means to have the life of God in us, not dead religion. Lord, thank you for your goodness that offers this, for the power that makes it possible, and that even as you brought life to Sarah and Abraham way after the, the natural time, you can bring life to us. Lord, bring that to us, that we may know you and live to you and, and rejoice and shout as, as it says here. That because of the life that we have, it's not something that's cold and impersonal, but real. And, and that, that we experience it and know it. And that we will rejoice and shout for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness and your mercy. Lord, we just look to you and ask for your mercy upon us yet to bring us to yourselves, to the truth. In the name of Jesus.